Shall we start the Q&A? Yes. Excellent. Here's the first. Dear Ajahn, is it normal to feel after a few sessions of meditation that you have enough for the day? We'll do more only tomorrow. No. <laughs> Imagine if the Buddha felt like that. He wouldn't have got enlightened. <coughs> Meditation is like relaxation to the max. Have you relaxed enough yet? Of course not. So I would say that that's somehow or other um, the defilements try, trying to cheat you out of having lots and lots and lots of nice meditation. But how you meditate, you don't need to focus and use effort. You sit down and relax. You sit down and after a while you get into a nice comfortable position and then you can relax. You're not trying to achieve anything. You're just trying to relax and be peaceful and be still. And it gets so pleasant that you don't want to do anything else. That's why sometimes you're meditating and a bell goes, no blooming bells. That's why Nobel silence is much better. So you just keep carrying on and relaxing to the max, enjoying yourself. I did do uh, something for the BGF in, in Kuala Lumpur just a few minutes ago. And somehow or other they put on here that this Mahindarama meditation retreat, they called it Club Med. <laughs> Penang. Which is, you know, I've used that many times. And I think it's a much better use of the term Club Med, meditation, because the ordinary Club Med, one of my friends, lay friends went there, and they, I asked them, what do you do in Club Med? And there's always something going on. Always have to play, uh, play tennis, or go scuba diving, or go skiing. And if you can't do it, they train you, give you more uh, uh, skills. And you're doing something every day. And in the evening, you go out for dinner, and you go shopping, and you go and visit the sites. My goodness, it's supposed to be a holiday, but people come back so tired. <laughs> They need to a real holiday. And when you go on a meditation retreat, it's so relaxing. You're resting. You're not pushing yourself, but you're allowing the body to get really peaceful and still and comfortable. That's why, if you really understand what a meditation retreat is, it's the best holiday you could ever have. And you can call it Club Med if you like. And it's very exclusive. Only the A-list of people in Malaysia can come here. The Club Med. I still remember this one executive from Sydney who came on my retreat in Perth. She came late because she said she had to beg and grovel to her boss. You know, a boss said, you're too valuable for the company. You know, you can't go away for a week. You've got to come and work here. That's what we pay you for. But she groveled and begged, and so he let her go. And she sent me this email when she returned, after the Monday, after she'd returned to Sydney after the nine-day retreat. And the email said, when I got back into the office and my boss looked at me, my boss said, what drug is Ajahn Brahm giving you in Perth? <laughs> I don't care what it is, but please bring me back some next time. Because she looks so much more peaceful and relaxed. We don't give out drugs, we just give out peace. And relaxation and stillness. Samadhi. Metta. Mindfulness. And the boss saw that straight away. As an uh, assistant executive, she looks so much happier and more peaceful. That's what really should happen when you go on a holiday. But a lot of time it doesn't. You come on this type of holiday, a retreat. What is a holiday anyway? It means holy day. 
And this is what it really is, real holiness, peacefulness, stillness. Dear Ajahn Brahm, I understand, I hope, so do I, the purpose of the noble silence. But since we retreatants are new to each other, we would like to get to know each other for the next two days. Can we have noble conversations? Well, I can't give permission for that because you're already talking to yourselves, <laughs> aren't you? Like today, I just come back a bit earlier to do this thing for the Buddhist Gem Fellowship in KL, and you were talking, <laughs> weren't you? How many of you, being honest, are practicing noble silence? <laughs> I don't mind you doing that, but those of you, especially when you get into the, uh, this part of the retreat, this part of the retreat is really helpful to be a bit more quiet. Because people have, you know, they got used to uh, the retreat, they notice, you know, they know where all the places are, they know what to do, and now you're so settled in. Now is more important that you keep silence. And when you do, it means that you can get deeper meditation, get more out of this retreat. And don't worry, you want to get to know each other. Actually, you get to know each other on a far deeper level with silence. It's weird for me to say this, but it's true. Many people, they sit opposite each other, eating. They don't say a word. They smile. They give metta to the people they share the dormitory with, but they don't say anything. Then you tend to bond far more deeply in a bond of trust and kindness and sensitivity. You don't need to speak. You just need to be still and be kind. That's the best way of bonding. And in a retreat where I actually live, you know, when we do a meditation retreat at Chana Grove and I stay there overnight and people are really quiet, the last day, I do this as a little exercise, but a teaching too. The very last morning I say, now if you want to, you can speak, but you don't have to. And no one speaks. They got you so used to silence and the beauty of silence, and in fact they can communicate with each other in silence. Just bear their, their body language. That's more than enough. They love it so much, they don't speak, even though they can. So thank you for that question, but I would actually encourage you to keep more silent on the last few days. Noble conversations for something after lunch. We will have time to something before the next meditation. Now keep it quiet. You know, noble conversations, is there such a thing? <laughs> a lot of time there isn't. So keep it quiet. Good evening, Ajahn Brahm. Firstly, I would like to thank you for your inspirational talk on kindness. It saved me from doing something drastic. Secondly, can you explain why I shed tears when I do dana and during meditation? Thank you. That's a lovely question. Why you shed tears? I cry when I hear an inspiring Dhamma talk. I cry when I go on pilgrimage to India and see the beautiful Dhamma Chaka statue, we haven't got it here behind us. It's the one with the little aura around the back. I've always admired that when I've seen photographs of it. But there were times, you know, when I've seen photographs, but I had never seen the real thing. But when I took a group on pilgrimage to India, I knew it was in the museum next to Sarnat, you know, the deer park outside of Benares. And so, you know, I asked, you know, the person leading the retreat, people were just relaxing, 
and my duty was finished, I said, can I go into the museum? I had to pay just a very small amount of rupees. Let me go in the museum. And I was looking for it. There's no person there I could ask, where is it? But then I was, I was exploring. And then it wasn't a big museum outside of Sarnat, but I turned a corner and there it was at the end of the corridor. And I couldn't help myself, just burst out in tears. It's one of the most beautiful Buddha statues I've ever seen. I don't know why I like that one more than any other one. But having a good cry, then I, I left. The next time I went on pilgrimage, that was one of the main things I was going to do, to go in there and just stay a bit longer with it. And I told you know, all of the people following me, this is what happened last time, but today I'll be more restrained. I know I knew what it was, so I was prepared. No, no need to cry. And I turned the corner. <laughs> I couldn't help it. And I know it's not tears of sadness or tears of desire, it's tears of inspiration. And so the third time, the third time I led a pilgrimage to India, I, again, I was ready for it this time. So I'm not going to try and stop it. I know it's going to happen. So I had you no know, tissues with me. And I told everybody following me, look, this is what happened to me last time. It's going to happen again. You don't have to follow me. It's just, I don't know why, but I just cry when I see that image. And I turned the corner. They were doing renovations. <laughs> They had a big tarpaulin over that Buddha while someone was painting the ceiling above it. I didn't cry, I thought, oh no. Expectations, I was looking forward to this. It's one of the highlights of the trip. And somebody was painting above it to protect that Buddha statue, they had a tarpaulin over it. I couldn't speak Hindi to ask the worker to take it off. He just looked at me and took it off. <laughs> that was beautiful, because I never asked, never expected anything. It was covered. But I don't know how he could read my mind. He was just a worker. But still, he uncovered that Buddha statue, and it's gorgeous. There's a few things like that which do make me cry. At the Vulture's Peak, I always cry up there. It's inspiring. And also, sometimes deep meditation. I told this to this couple, they're very old now. She used to be a Christian, her husband was a Buddhist, but they came on one of the pilgrimages to India, and I told them that some of these places, I don't know what it is, but they've got so much power behind them. And you tend to sort of burst out crying. I told them that's what I do. And the lady, she was English, uh, from Devon. And she said, look, I grew up in UK. I know in UK that there are many old places, you know, places where you know, many, many things have happened over so many years. It reminds me of that story of uh, one of the Australian women who went over to um, UK. And of course, as a tourist, one thing you always have to do is go and see the old castles. So she went into one of these old castles, and the guide took her down to where the dungeons used to be. There's many really evil things happened in those dungeons. She never believed in ghosts, but when she went down there, ooh, it was spooky. Now, even the floorboards, you know, you and the floorboards, you'd trot on them. <clears throat> they squeaked. You open the doors, the old wooden oaken doors. <clears throat> and even when the wind blew through the open windows. <sighs> I'm sorry, but that's the best sound effects I can do. <laughs> It was really creepy down there. And so when she actually got 
up the stairs and outside again, she was very relieved. But she couldn't help ask the guide, you know, in the years you've been taking people around this castle, the dungeons especially, have you ever seen a ghost? And quite honestly, the, uh, the guide said, no, in all the years I've been down here, I've never seen a ghost. She was kind of relieved, but she asked the next question, which she shouldn't have asked. How long have you lived down here? He said, over 300 years. <laughs> That's only a joke, not a true story. But anyway, this English lady said, this is rubbish. I've seen so many old castles. Just because it's an old building, that doesn't really affect you. So when we landed at uh, Gaia Airport, and then just we went to see, you know, Bod Gaia for the first time, went into the big building there, not big building, the small building. When we went in there, Okay, somebody's got one in the back there. <laughs> when we went in there, we just, uh, you know, we did some meditation, a you know, quick sort of uh, bit of chanting. And that evening she came. She said, I have to see you to apologize. She bowed three times and said, I thought you were crazy. When you told, told us some of these buildings have lots and lots of power, I didn't believe you, but as soon as I walked in that uh, big temple in the Mahabodhi temple, where the Buddha became enlightened, she was English as anything. She said, I just burst into tears and I just could not stop. I don't know what went on there, but it was real, totally unexpected. I just felt so much joy and energy going to see the place where the Buddha became enlightened. It does have power. And so sometimes you can cry, sometimes you hear a beautiful Dhamma talk, and it really gets to you. One of the most beautiful things. I remember <laughs> sometimes some of the monks, other monks who come to my temple in Bodhinyana and given talks. I remember this one monk, and he's still alive, he's one of Ajahn uh, Mahabur's disciples. He gave this talk and I don't know, the way he put it was it really touched me. And I, tears came down my eyes. And afterwards, he said, you liked my talk, didn't you? I said, yes. <laughs> <laughs> it's joy, it's happiness. If that occurs to you, just please let it happen. It's totally, it's kusala, it's noble, it's wonderful. It's just a form of what they call pity. Pity, the joy which happens in meditation or reading the Dhamma. It's like, you know, suddenly, you, like you've come home. Something in the past, deep in the past, probably previous lives, has resonated with you. And it means so much. That is one of the reasons why people do go on pilgrimages. Not to just see it in a photograph, it gets right into your heart. Something from the past, a long, long, long time ago, before you were born is actually touched. Have you ever cried when you've gone on pilgrimage? There we go, yeah. Is that because of just not being able to go to the toilet because they're all dirty? <laughs> <laughs> no, it's because it was sometimes really inspiring. Oh. Dear Ajahn Brahm, may I know how to deal with fear or worry thoughts during meditation? Thank you. Fear thoughts. I, I've been teaching meditation, teaching Dharma for so many years. The first big talk I gave was when I was four years as a monk, which was now 45 years ago. And Ajahn Chah asked me, to give the one hour long talk in Thai <laughs> and the full moon in February. It's called Marka Puja in Thailand. And he asked me to give the talk, you know, two or three thousand people, and also you know, my teacher. So I've been teaching for a long time now. 
I've never ever seen any negative consequences from meditation or from teaching. I've just seen beautiful consequences. People seeing the Dhamma, people understanding what meditation really is, people healing their cancers, people reconciling with their parents. Oh, here's one story. When, I don't think I've told it yet, because I give so many talks, I don't know what I talked yesterday, what I talked last week. Last week was in Singapore, three days ago I was here. That was when I was visiting Brisbane. And I just had one day in Brisbane, and a disciple offered to feed me for that day, so I went to his house for a meal, just chatting while the meal was being prepared. Now he was there, his son was there, his youngest son was there, but his, eld his eldest son wasn't there. So where's your eldest son? And you know, the father just grimaced, and the youngest son said, they haven't seen each other for seven years. I said, why? What happened? And the youngest son, well, I don't know. But they fell out. And I said, where does your elder brother live? He said, he still lives in Brisbane, but not far away. There was a Sri Lankan family. There's something about Sri Lankan families. They know me, and they're a bit very, very, very respectful of me to the point of being a bit scared of me. <laughs> and so I asked him, your brother, where does he live? He lives here in Brisbane, not far away. Do you have his phone number? He said, yes. Give him a call right now and give me the phone. So he called his elder brother, who hadn't been into his father's house for seven years, hadn't spoken or seen him for seven years. Give him a call. So he called and got through to his elder brother to give the phone to me. And on the mobile phone, I said, this is Ajahn Brahm here. Do you know who I am? Oh, Ajahn Brahm, yes. <laughs> what are you calling me for? I'm at your father's house. Come over now. And I hung up. <laughs> the poor man didn't have a choice. If I ordered him to come, he kind of had to come, otherwise it would be really, really, really bad karma. <laughs> so in about five or ten minutes, he arrived at his father's house. He came in. The first time he'd been in his dad's house for such a long time. So said, sit next to your father. The two sat next to each other, but they didn't look at each other. <laughs> They're looking the opposite way. I can use like the power which they give to me. And I said to the father, first of all, still not looking at his son, why? You know, how come this is your son? How come you've fallen out, never seen each other or talked to each other for seven years? You know what he said? He said, I can't remember. I don't know. And I asked the elder son, who'd been estranged from his dad, do you know what happened? He said, I don't know what happened either. It's kind of weird. <laughs> That's what I always remember. I said, okay, turn around, look at each other. Come on, hug each other. Seven years is long enough. So they reconciled. And the weird thing is they reconciled over something which they shouldn't have been split up for anyway. Something which maybe was important at the time, but they forgot about now. So I brought them together. That's inspiring. Isn't that kind of gorgeous and beautiful? Father and son have been split up and they couldn't even remember why. <laughs> now they could actually reconcile. So, okay, that, leave that alone. So I've never seen anything bad happen with these teachings. I've never seen anything, um, any person die or get sick during meditation. I've just seen people heal during the meditation. Basically, there's absolutely nothing to fear. If you want to go out um, driving a car, yeah, I've seen people die driving a car back home, accidents. If, if you want to go skydiving, crikey, that really is dangerous. But meditating? There's absolutely no danger at all. You get healthy. 
You live a long, long, peaceful life. Is that anything to be afraid of? That's one of the reasons why. And there's some people say, oh, don't meditate. It's scary. And I say, no, it's scary not to meditate. That's the thing to be afraid of, not meditating. You have the opportunity now, so please take it. I've never, in all the retreats I've given, no one has ever died or got sick. And I've given a huge amount of retreats, and lots of talks. So you, please be reasonable, be scientific, be logical. You've got nothing to fear in meditation except for freedom. Why do people sometimes experience fear when they see a beautiful limiter? And I mentioned earlier, it's the same fear as people get when they've been in prison for maybe eight, nine, ten years, and tomorrow you're being released from jail. You kind of get used to being in prison, familiar with it, and the idea of being outside and being free is a bit scary. But I think you understand, being free is worth just going past that fear and experience the beauty of being not in a prison anymore. Worry, thoughts during meditation? Goodness gracious, I don't know what you want to worry about, but the best thing you can ever do for your future, the, be in the place where your future is being made is right now. This is where your future is being created by you. If you stay here and have kindness, this is the best you can possibly do for your future. And I've said this, I've seen it, I'm not lying or exaggerating, I've seen so many times people with cancers and other nasty diseases, they come in this moment right here and those cancers vanish. I've, I've been 72 years as a monk, many years as a teacher, I've seen it too often. There's one story I, I told in an interview room of this, uh, George his name was, he was an old Londoner, he was a Cockney, and his accent was so thick, I was the only monk and then a big sangha in Perth, you could understand him. You know, he's speaking English, but Cockney English. And I said, Ajahn Brahm, what did he say? <laughs> <laughs> so we were good friends, but his story was, in those days, he was old, maybe about 20 years older than I was, in those days that people would smoke cigarettes. That was just what men did. And no one actually knew how bad it was for your health, so he developed lung cancer. And he told me the story going to see his uh, cancer expert, and the cancer expert had done an x-ray of his lungs. They didn't do CT scans in those days, x-rays, and showed him the x-ray. Now you've got cancer tumors in every part of your lungs. If we did the usual treatment of uh, surgery, we'd have to take out all of your lungs, 100%. You'd have nothing left to breathe with. It would kill you. We can't do that. We can give you chemotherapy or radiation therapy, but this was when it was, this treatment was in its infancy. Maybe you can live for another uh, uh, two or three months, well, that's probably the max. We'll do that for you, though. And he said, I'll go home and I'll talk it over with my wife, which he did. And basically, the doctor was telling him there's not really a point to um, having any more treatment. It was too far advanced. It'd only give you an extra couple of months. It'd be very unpleasant. So he went back to the... Uh, the specialist and said, thought I was my wife, decided just let nature take its course, you know, no more treatment. But the doctor insisted on doing another x-ray to see how 
the uh, cancer had progressed. And he was in the room looking at the new x-ray. The doctor was shaking his head. And poor old George, he told me, you got really scared. And he said, it's got worse, hasn't it? Be honest with me. And the doctor looked up at George and said, George, it hasn't got worse. The reason I'm shaking my head is it's totally disappeared. It's vanished. What on earth have you been doing, George? And George said, I've been meditating. And the doctor said, carry on. <laughs> And he was in remission for years. I think he eventually died of old age because he was one of the oldies. But he was always a really good friend. And the fact that he just did that and it just vanished within a week or two, that was really weird how fast that was. But I, I've seen that. These are real, true stories. So you don't need to be afraid or worried. No, let's get into this meditation. You're lucky you can come here and do it. Well done, it's so fortunate. I won't be afraid, I'll be afraid of you know the days going past so fast. Dear Ajahn Brahm, is it too late for a female of over 55 years old to go into monastic life? No, not according to the Vinaya, but because of the nuns' monasteries just kind of starting up in places like Malaysia, or UK, or Australia. Because of that, it just gets difficult to look after you. I mean, you're going to get old, and please don't think, try and talk your grandma into going to become a monk because you get <laughs> free health care. <laughs> and the poor young nuns have difficulty just looking after you, and we will look after you. You know that's going to happen. We don't abandon people. And so because of that, we have to make sure there's enough younger nuns to look after the older ones. So that's the only problem there. Later on, when there's lots and lots and lots of nuns, like lots and lots and lots of monks, there should be no problem. And even according to the Vinaya, there is no age limit. I think the oldest person who became a monk in the Vinaya was this fellow, he was 114, I think I said. A crazy age. And he decided to renounce 114. He became a novice monk first of all, then a full monk, just within a, in a month or two. Then he managed to break through to being a stream winner and a couple of months later, he became fully enlightened. He left everything to the last minute, but he actually made it. <laughs> That's not recommended to leave it to the last moment. 114 years, it was 110 or something, but it's in his hundreds when he became uh, fully enlightened, and when he ordained. It's possible. And as far as I'm concerned, you'd love to be able to make that opportunity available. You know, if somebody's really old and they, they really want to become uh, a monastic and they want to meditate and they've got enough skill in meditation already that they're not much of a problem to anybody, but they can get into some deep meditations. So basically, it depends on the person. In the meantime, you're 55, that's not old. But for some people, we think, well, maybe 10 years' time. How will you be? That's the only reason. I kind of don't like that idea of saying, you're over 50, you can't be a nun, or you can't be a monk. That's totally unfair. In some monasteries, they have to do that. Do you imagine how to inculcate discipline? Discipline, what does discipline mean? Is discipline punishment? This is one of the things which I was rebellious against when I was at school as a teacher. What did discipline achieve? Discipline just achieved some very, very clever young men and women avoiding being caught. 
not by not doing things. For example, even these days, I did ask, are there speed cameras in Penang? Yes, there are, and you know the usual spots for them. So they don't actually warn you or change your behavior. You just sometimes have these little devices in your car, which go beep, 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 speed camera ahead. So you miss the purpose of it. The main purpose, you know, of discipline is self-discipline, not doing anything which harms or hurts another being, not doing anything which harms or hurts yourself. If you break a rule and you're punished, what does that teach you? It doesn't teach you much at all, because next time you still break the rule, but you try and get out of the punishment, get a better lawyer. Punishment makes you hide the truth. If people didn't have punishment, where this actually came from, you know, because as a monk you see you know, people come to your classes, and they bring their kids, and in Bodhinyana Monastery over in Dhammaloka, wherever I'm the boss, I allow the kids to play. They run around, they maybe cause a little bit of disturbance, but I'd rather have them feeling at home in the temple or the monastery. They get used to them. I say, kids, the kids love to play. When they're playing, they're exploring. And when they're exploring, they're growing in their wisdom and their understanding of other human beings. And then, later on, when they get to be teenagers, They've got these monks and nuns who are like uh, extra god parents to them. And this is actually what happens. I know these ladies, now they're ladies and gentlemen. There was this one girl, she came to me one Saturday morning and she said, I really need your help. You know, well, what's happened? Because they trusted me, they've grown up with me. They told me straight away that you know, she was pregnant. You know, she you know, didn't say no. And because of that, she was pregnant, unmarried. She was a student at university. My first response was, have you told your parents yet? And she said, no, they'll kill me if they found out. That's what I came to see you for. Can you tell my parents for me? <laughs> That's what she said, and I was actually kind of honored by that. You know, I could be of service and really help her. Now, of course, this shouldn't happen, but human beings make mistakes. So she made a mistake. So when I saw her parents, I said, what have you been doing to your daughter that they're af she's afraid of you? This was a time she needs you more than ever. She's made a mistake, she's pregnant. She needs your help. And they understood that, and so they were so kind to her. You know, we're not going to punish you or scold you. You know, it's happened. We wish it didn't happen. But now we can see how we can help you. Well, wonderful parents, that is. Sometimes it may be your son gets involved in drugs. It happens. It's not because your son is a bad kid. Sometimes they get just sucked into that you know, by their friends. Are they able to tell you? Or are they scared of you? I try and tell the parents. I do this when people get married, marriage blessings. If you do have children, please tell them that whatever you do, whatever you get up to, whatever trouble you manage to get yourself in, please tell your mum and dad, as long as you are honest, you will never get punished by us. Because honesty is the most important. Tell us. And we use our extra knowledge of the world, we're adults, to try and get you out of that problem. And that's a beautiful thing to offer to your children. 
If you punish them too much, they get so scared of you, they won't tell you anything. It's the same with the relationship, husband and wife. Please, when you do get married, tell your partner. You can tell me anything, as long as you tell me the truth. I'll be disappointed sometimes, but I won't sort of shout at you, or punish you, or divorce you. The truth is so important. Why do people lie? Why do politicians lie? Because it's more beneficial to lie than to tell the truth, they say. We don't respect the truth enough in our societies. So that's one of the reasons why we have that fourth precept of not lying. Instead of just punishing a person for lying, why do they lie? Because it's not worth telling the truth, they say. The punishment will be just unbearable. So I want to change that as best we possibly can. Say to one another, if you tell the truth, no punishments, we'll try and help in whatever we can do. So that's actually where the idea of discipline comes from. Too much discipline creates fear, and fear hides the truth. I take five precepts. Is non-alcoholic beer permitted? Yes, it is permitted, as long as it's non-alcoholic. I showed a couple of you the other day that I was offered some cider, apple cider, and straight away my brain said, cider is alcoholic. But then I did go on my tablet internet and found out this particular cider, you see me drinking it when I do the interviews, this cider is Bundaberg, apple cider, so, I think call it soft drink. I checked on the internet, it's alcohol free. Life is very confusing these days. <laughs> but at least you can check it out. And I've been drinking that almost every day for the last three days. Have I looked drunk? <laughs> so, so it's not alcoholic. Same with beer, it's not alcoholic. Or sometimes, Sometimes you have, you know, you know that one of my favorite foods was fish and chips, and a couple of times I had fish and chips. Sometimes they have it with beer batter. They put beer in the, the batter. I thought, this is a bit unallowable for monks, surely. But when you cook things which have got alcohol in it, the alcohol vanishes. So it is non-alcoholic. I've had that many times, and again, I've never been drunk. So this is one of the reasons why the five precepts, it has to be alcohol in it. And that's non-alcoholic beer is allowable. And that is a beautiful thing, I must admit, for people over in Australia. People who like their beer or they like their wine, and they can get wines which are non-alcoholic. They've still got the taste. They haven't got the alcohol. They got caffeine or coffee, which has been decaffeinated. So you can still enjoy the taste of the coffee if you've grown up with it, but it doesn't sort of make you over-energized. So there is, you know, some helpful things being done. Does that make sense to you? Anyway, next question. Experience, oh my goodness, experience phenomena arise, goodness, meditation from result, meditation. Lay person allowed to share to Dharma friends our experiences phenomena that arise as a result from meditation. Are lay persons allowed to share uh, this with Dhamma friends? That a lay person that achieves Sotapanna, can he tell public regard his attainment? 
the first thing, if you do get anything from deep meditation, you know, like nimittas or jhanas or these insights like stream winning, there was this nun who's a very wonderful nun over in Australia. She was trained over in Japan. Japan, no, sorry, in South Korea. And her teacher told her, and this is what I share with you, if any of you do sort of experience things like a, a stream winning, please don't tell everybody. Otherwise, you'll have to spend the rest of your life proving it. <laughs> it's weird, but there's more jealousy than there is this wonderful uh, state of mudita. Mudita is you enjoy other people's successes. But instead the people say, no, you can't be a stream winner. And they cause you so many problems. If it's a close dhamma friend, fine. Or someone, you know, you a small group of people who practice together, but don't go saying it far and wide. And it's also, you know, do you really know what these states of enlightenment are? One of the suttas which inspired me was where um, this monk came to see the Buddha, and Ananda was is uh, the Buddha's attendant. And this monk said to the Buddha, one who is fully enlightened never thinks they are better than anybody else, never thinks they are worse than anyone else, never thinks they are the same as anyone else. And the Buddha said, correct. And then a few minutes later another monk came and said the same thing to the Buddha. One who is enlightened never thinks they're better, worse, or the same as anybody else. Yes, correct. And then the Buddha turned around to Ananda and said, those were two people who just become arahats. And I love that description because that gives you an idea of what it feels like to be enlightened. You don't go around wanting to tell other people because you never think you are better. You never think you are worse, you never think you're the same. That whole sense of judgment has disappeared. So anyone who says, I'm an arahat, I deserve respect. Yeah, sure. <laughs> you're not an arahat at all. So be careful. Tell a few friends, but don't tell too many. Dear Ajahn Brahm, does meditation encourage blood flow through the body and thus aid healing? Yes, it does. I remember just those days when I was a young monk and I used to, I didn't travel very much, I used to give blood every three months or six months. But then eventually he started going over to all these other places like to Thailand and stuff and they said, no, no, you can't give blood because there's the dengue fever and other things over there. But anyhow, in those days when I used to give blood regularly, I went with another man, a new monk. We gave blood together in the Red Cross. And as we were, after we gave blood, they had to test your blood pressure first of all. And they looked at this new monk and they said, your blood pressure has really gone down. And then they looked at him. He had a bald head and brown robe. And they asked him before he could respond, you haven't been meditating, have you? He said, yes, I'm a monk now. Oh, that explains it. I remember hearing that. He was an executive in one of the power companies before. High stress job. Now he was a monk. The blood pressure had gone way down. That's understood. So sometimes, even in the United States, there's many monks over there, they've told me, if you can put like a... a a statutory declaration, you meditate regularly, you get quite a significant reduction in the money you have to pay for your health insurance. Everybody knows that. People who meditate regularly are far more healthy. Even the insurance companies recognize that. 
and give you a big discount. Does that happen in Malaysia? That's unfair. <laughs> Euthanasia allowed in Buddhism. There's two types of euthanasia. Be very careful, the one which we usually talk about is called voluntary euthanasia. That means that you make the decision. You can't decide to euthanize somebody else. That's killing. That's one of the reasons why the people who have advanced sicknesses but they're still healthy, in this, oh, it's not healthy, they're still in full command of their faculties. Emotionally they're uh, at ease but their body is really just dying very quickly. They are allowed in Australia to apply for voluntary euthanasia. And they go through such a lot of hurdles. They have to have a disease which is terminal. You know, that basically the two or three doctors sign off on it, yes, is, there's no rational uh, possibility that they're going to survive. And then, number two, they're in full command of their mental faculties. And they go through so many heap, hoops and hoops, and if they decide that that's what they wish to do, then it's allowed. That's voluntary euthanasia. A similar question is, how many of you have pets at home? And if you have a pet at home, say a dog or a cat, what do you do when that dog or cat gets very old and very sick? And you take it to the vet, and the vet said, your dog is suffering, it needs to be put down. That's a dilemma for you. You can't break your first precept of Parnati Pata, and this is your pet dog which you love. But then, it's getting sick and it's suffering. So what do you do? There is a wonderful solution to that. This was a, one of our disciples in Perth. She had a dog. The dog got cancer. She spent a fortune trying to heal that cancer in that dog. But nevertheless, the dog got sicker and sicker and sicker until one day the vet said, I think you have to allow me to euthanize your dog. He's suffering and there's no hope of recovery. And you may have had to be asked that question before. The vet can't do it, you have to give permission first of all. So she followed my advice. I said, don't euthanize your dog yet. Ask your dog first. That may sound a bit strange, but it's very, very meaningful. So she asked for a few minutes with her dog, cradling it you know, towards the end of its life, it seemed. Cradled it, looked in its eyes and said, do you want to die now? It's your choice. If that's your dog, you've loved him, cared for him for so many years, you know the answer. You don't have to have psychic powers. You feel. And this time, she was with her dog, alone, and she got very clear communication. The dog did not want to die. So she took it back to the vet and said, no. I won't allow you to uh, euthanize the dog. You can't give it the injection. And the vet started scolding this woman. You call yourself a Buddhist? Buddhists are really cruel and selfish. You're just following these rules. That dog is suffering. I thought you cared about animals, but you're giving this dog more suffering. You stupid woman. The, the vet was very cruel. But then she said, well, it's my decision. So she took the dog home. Six months later, 
She took the dog to the vet again. <laughs> <laughs> the dog had made a full recovery. And because of that, you know, the, the vet looked at the dog, examined it, well, what's going on? So you Buddhists are very clever and very smart. <laughs> And that's happened many, many times. So if you've got a dog or a cat, ask it first of all. If that dog or cat says, look, I've had enough, please take me to the vet to get inoculated, to get uh, put down, you can do that. It's not your decision. Your dog, your cat has made that decision. And that takes all the sense of what should I do? Am I killing that animal? You're not. The dog is making the decision itself, which is its right. Dear Ajahn, as a biology student in high school, I participate in the killing of frogs for experiment, not knowing the five precepts and what are the consequences of killing the frogs. It's okay, you won't be reborn as a frog. <laughs> The consequences, you always see here, you feel a bit of guilt. You didn't really know what you were doing. So the karmic consequences are much lighter. But what else have you done in your life? Is that the only thing you've done? Killed a frog? Or killed a two or three frogs? You can't judge a life by one or two you know, misconceived acts. A good example of that is suicide. What happens if you commit suicide? The Sri Lankan family came to see me one of the first weeks of the rains retreat a few years ago. They came to see me because they'd woken up in the morning, their 17-year-old son, they saw him on the end of a rope on the veranda. He committed suicide. No reason at all. He was happy at school, doing well, had a girlfriend at the school, a very nice young man. They couldn't understand why he committed suicide. And his younger brother was so shocked he just wouldn't speak to anybody. So they came to see me and I said to them, you know, I got the information as much as they could give me, and I said, well, what was he going to be doing soon? Because I know that at that age, in a few months' time, he would be doing the examinations to get to university, or not to get to university, at the end of the, the uh, year 12. It was the American system, kind of. The year 12 at university. The year 12, sorry, at school, before you go to university. And they said he was doing really, really well. We don't know why. No, he, he showed no signs of depression or fear. And I asked the family, I said, how many exams would he, how many subjects would he be studying for at the end of year exams? And they said, five. How many papers for each exam? They said, maybe two papers on each exam. That's ten papers. How many questions on each paper? Well, it, it differs, but maybe let's say eight. Eight questions on each paper, that's ten papers, that's eighty questions you'd have to answer to get to university. Now suppose the first seventy-nine questions he did in those five subjects were perfect answers. But the last question he answered, he made a big mess of. Seventy-nine perfect answers, one terribly wrong. Would that mean he doesn't get to go to university? And they said, no, 79 out of 80, he'd probably go to whatever university he wants to. It's a really good score. And they said, well, that's like your son. He'd been a really good boy all his life. The first 79 questions He's answered in life. He's did wonderful answers. Now he's made a mess of the last question in his life. Does that mean he can't go to a heavenly realm or get reborn as a human? Of course not. You don't get judged just on your last act. 
It's all those other things you've done are important too. So because of that I said, you don't have to worry about your son. You told me, and I believe you, he was a very good boy. He just made a mess of the last question. So you don't have to add to the grief of parents whose son or daughter has committed suicide. You don't need to add to that by saying, he's going to go to hell, he's going to burn, he's going to suffer. That is just so sadistic. Now, anyone who says that, especially if a monk says that, I think, get out of here, I don't want to be your friend. You don't understand the Dhamma at all. So this is actually with things like suicide. See the big picture. You're not judged for one or two acts in your life. But sometimes we do that. You all know the story of the two bad bricks in the wall. That was a great eye-opener for me because I wanted to destroy the wall because I had two faulty bricks. And I just couldn't appreciate the good bricks in the wall, which were far more in number, until somebody said, that's a beautiful wall. You must be blind. Can't you see the two bad bricks? Yes, but I can also see it's more than 998, more like 9,998 good bricks. And that wall is still there. I lost it for many, many years because it wasn't important to me anymore. But then I thought, it's still there, it must be there. And I found it, it's in the male section of the ablution block in Bodhinyana Monastery. That's why I can't take you in there to visit. <laughs> Maybe a monk urinating in there or something. But it's still there. Why is it just one or two mistakes we think that person has to go to hell? Of course they don't. They're more than that. I don't know about this, but there was even in a prison close by to Bodhinyana Monastery, Karna Prison Farm. In there, I haven't visited for a while, but other monks have visited. And there's a, a person in that jail, they're coming to the end of their sentence, they are a murderer, they committed two murderers. Two murders. They were he confessed, he did it, he's not trying to get out of it. But he did say, once he read the story of the two bad bricks, there's only two murders. <laughs> there's so many people I did murder. And I say sadhu to him. He's not a murderer. He did two murders. He's more than that. If once he's released he thinks he's a murderer, of course he has to do it again. If he thinks he's more than the murders he did, he doesn't have to do that again. He can be free. Okay, I've talked too much. And so many questions. Dear Ajahn Brahm, I really realize I need to love myself. For E.G., how do I reward love myself when I had a good sit sit a sitting? I am like a strict parent to make myself more persistent. How do I do it with loving kindness? You find it far more effective to have loving kindness if you're a parent. Am I a strict teacher? Am I like a loving parent to you? Now look how many disciples I've got. It works. If I was strict my goodness, half of you will not even come through this door. You'll be afraid. <laughs> See, that kindness is highly effective. It does work. Even to try and get the best out of your children. Don't always be strict on them, but be close to them. Find out you know, what they're afraid of. Find out how they work. There will come a time in your life your children will rebel against you. They don't, need, they don't need to follow you. That's where you have to be smart. How you're smart, I think I did tell you about that man from Malacca whose child was not doing very well at university. He's really close to being kicked out. And he, he and his wife told him many times you know, just 
do your assignments, go to the lectures, read the books, put some effort you know, into your life at university. And even though they said that many times, still he didn't listen to his parents. So his father tried a much smarter way. His son had a girlfriend. That story, yes. He waited for his son and girlfriend to come home late one night. And he invited both of them into the, the house. He never talked to his son, he just talked to his girlfriend. He said, you've been going out a long time now together. I don't know, maybe in the future, I can't predict this, I'm not going to force you. Maybe in the future, may even just get married together. But I just wanted to tell you, young lady, that this boy is probably going to get kicked out of university. I'm sure you don't want to marry someone who's to be kicked out of university, do you? He said, no, I never knew that, said the girl. He never told me that. I just thought I'd let you know. Good night, have a wonderful night together. <laughs> and that was it. His son was done for. Every time they went out together, you know, his girlfriend, he liked her. Have you done your assignment yet? What was your grade? Was it in, in time? She was on his case all the time. He wouldn't listen to his mother or to his father, but he sure had to listen to his girlfriend. If you know men, you notice how wise that is. If you've got children, if you've got a son, he hasn't got a girlfriend, get him a girlfriend. <laughs> then you'll have full power over him. Oh yeah, what's this good? How to love yourself. Oh my goodness. It's much nicer loving yourself. You know when there was COVID, you, know, you weren't allowed to hug anybody. As a monk, I'm not supposed to hug anybody. And then and if I hug someone and think, if I hug a guy, he said, you must be gay, I said, I'm, I'm not. If I hug a girl, that's even worse. You must really like her. So I never get any hugs. I thought, that's not nice. So I decided to hug myself. <laughs> do that. Come on, everybody. Now, not just like that. Really do it properly. Give it 100%. Oh, that's nice. You can't catch something you don't already have. So it's healthy for you. <laughs> And, and number two is you can't be uh, accused of abusing anybody. You do it to yourself. That's not abuse. So what that does mean is you can give yourself, learn how to give yourself some love. You can feel it. You can really give yourself a beautiful hug. It works. And then it means you're a much softer, kinder person. And when you go to work, I don't know, in your company, if you're kind to all the people who you employ, they will always work harder for you. They like you. And they enjoy going to your workplace. So because of that, you, they want to make sure that company survives. Dear Ajahn, I cheated in assignments to pass exams before. What is the karma to face for such cheating? <laughs> the reason we have, I don't, I don't know, but you know, sometimes I can sympathize with you. Because I was a school teacher, I had to set exams, and what a stupid thing that was. You were not sort of finding out how smart a person was, you just found out whether they could pass exams or not. And I, I was a Buddhist from such an early age. And when I was doing exams, you could see that one of your friends, you know, sitting next to you or sitting you know, a couple of seats away, they were struggling with an answer. I knew the answer. Why couldn't I help them? To me, that was compassion. <laughs> the teacher said, no, that's cheating. In real life, if somebody in your office doesn't know the answer, you help them. 
that helping people is part of what we discourage in exams. It's far too personal, far too much about me, not about helping others. I often thought that at schools or university we should just have little groups and maybe 50% of your score is your personal score and 50% is averaged over the group to which you belong. So we are actually rewarding cooperation and working together rather than just about me. As is the office politics where you work? Is that good for the company? Of course it never is. Imagine that happened in a football team. We never pass the ball, we just want to score ourselves. Some football players are like that. They don't get very far. It's all about the team. To be successful in life, it's about the family. It's about my monastery and all the monks I share my, my food with. If it's over here, it's about the whole people on this retreat. It's not about you, it's always about us. In exams, they forget that. So, you cheat in assignments to pass exams before. Okay, if you pass the exams, great, you don't have to do exams anymore. There was a, this was in the, the wall of the philosophy department at Cambridge University. I remember seeing it there. It was a slogan. The graffiti they had at Cambridge University was really meaningful. It said, exams kill by degrees. Now, kill by degrees means like slowly kill things. And that was so true. Just because you passed the degree did not mean you understood the subject. Many people who got low scores in their degrees really understood you know, the nature of the, of the uh, subjects they did. Albert Einstein got kicked out of university. Michael Dell left university. Steve Jobs left university. Who else? There's, there's quite a few. Really, they got very wealthy and very successful. So if your son or daughter doesn't pass the exams and gets kicked out, they could be the next billionaire. <laughs> <laughs> now I say that because, isn't that weird? Exams measure intellectual intelligence. What really counts in life is the emotional intelligence. The ability to work together with people. The ability to make those networks where you can ask someone for help on something you don't know yourself. Then your wisdom base gets so wide. Exams miss that. So, okay, I forgive you. Don't do it again. I don't mean don't cheat, I mean don't do exams again. <laughs> <laughs> I'm rebe rebellious. Dear Ajahn, what is the method to counteract the fear of ghosts? It's a do research, go and find a ghost. <laughs> and then ask it, poor ghost, you know, how are you? Look at ghosts, I mean, what do ghosts do during the daytime? They only come out at night. Do they sleep somewhere? Ghosts, I mean, do they get married? They're not all male ghosts, there's some female ghosts as well. If a male ghost likes a female ghost, can they sort of get married somewhere and start a family of little ghosts? <laughs> what do they do? What you can do, if you can find a ghost, give them an interview. <laughs> and once you have the interview, what it's really like to be a ghost, send it off to uh, the New Straits Times. You can make a fortune syndicating that article. It hasn't been done before. <laughs> and <laughs> an in-depth interview with a real ghost. It'll answer many questions. Why are you afraid? 
A lot of time because you don't know what a ghost is and how it works. The poor ghosts are just other, like other beings, just like little snakes or spiders. Have you actually? Do you have many snakes around Penang? No or yes? Sorry. Where you stay? Yes, there are snakes, aren't there? Are they dangerous? Are you sure? <laughs> a lot of times, if you ask the snake, the snake says human beings are more dangerous than we are. More snakes get killed by humans than humans get killed by snakes. Check that out. The only reason the snake would attack you is because it's afraid for its life. If you're kind to snakes, the snakes will never harm you. I've trod on snakes in Thailand. I jumped one way, the snake jumped another way. We looked at each other. I apologized straight away. And the snake just was scared. It didn't want to harm me. I just opened the door so it could go away. And I gave it a meta chart. May all snakes be happy and well, but not in my hut. <laughs> So these are the snakes and ghosts are the same. They're beings in this universe. And of course when people are just afraid of them, they don't know what to do. And so if you can be kind to them, it's a wonderful act of gentleness. And you never lose out. The reason is, of course, you've seen too many movies of, of ghosts. And of course, you know, those aren't real. They just, they try to excite you. To the one I respect the most, Ajahn Brahm, can you please help to stop the COVID from spreading, please? Easy. How many of you got COVID here? That's all. <laughs> That's pretty good to actually just drop it spreading. How can you actually stop it spreading? One of them is by changing attitude. I was a scientist before. A lot of times, fear spreads plagues. I remember reading that in a short story by an old novelist called what was it, Edgar Allan Poe, The Mask of the Red Death, written about over a hundred years ago. They had this idea of all these spirits went to the different cities of Europe to spread disease, especially this plague called the Red Death. And they came together one day in a forest to compare notes. And one of them was asked, how many people did you kill in London from the, the Red Death? He said about a thousand. In Berlin, how many did you kill? About 1,200. In Paris, how many? 1,500. In Amsterdam, how many did you kill? And he said, I only killed about 100. And fear killed 2,000. I remember when I was reading that, I thought, wow. And that was really powerful. It's a fear. It's one of the things you have with any disease you should also be careful of. Because the fear makes you feel tense. You know, when you maybe get uh, an infection, you get maybe the bug inside you, and you're afraid of it, and it allows you, when you're tense and tight, it allows it to actually to grow inside of you. And your response system, immune response system, doesn't work as well as it normally would do. So please, if you have, the, I was going to say positive attitude, but you can't always be positive. Don't be positive when you take a COVID test. <laughs> <laughs> Otherwise, be positive. But with a much more positive mind, you find there's an immunity happens. If you're afraid, 
your immunity goes down. That's only my wisdom. It'd be wonderful if that was checked out. Someone did a scientific study on that. I'm sure it would be true. So that's my job. And I'm doing that. That's one of the reasons why I can't understand why I don't get COVID. You know, I associate with more people than anybody else. And you know, I don't wear masks. I don't have COVID. I know all I can share with you is <laughs> my smile. I think that's important. Anyway. Sorry? I did have a couple of vaccines. That was the first time I've been, I had a, a jab for years. And I couldn't believe just how sharp the needles are now. <laughs> and when I was saying when I had scrub typhus, oh, those needles were very blunt <laughs> jabbing you. But these ones, you know, they're so sharp, they put them in your arm, you can't even feel it. It's amazing to the technology what it does. And the only reason I took those jabs was so I can get permission to fly to teach you. <laughs> if I didn't have that jab, I wouldn't be able to get on the aircraft. Dear Ajahn, um, since Ajahn Yana Dhamma guide us, I look past noises and look for silence. Great. Now I hear it all the time. Silence. Great. It is sometimes accentuated with creaking sound of crickets and insects, and insects, especially when I meditate. If it is good, teach me how to do even more still. Great. I mean, the stillness, the silence is wonderful. Once you have that silence, See if you can also get the inner joy as well in the mind. In this moment, in the inner joy, and just move away from noise. You're peaceful. You're still. And maybe there's no noise at all to listen to. When that happens, then the mind gets so still, it doesn't have to do anything. Breath can come up very easily. And not just the breath, but the joy, the nimittas come up. When those nimittas come up, these lights in the mind, then you're really, really getting into some lovely meditation. The mind is now powerful. Okay, there's lots more. But okay, I'm going to tell this story. I always say I shouldn't tell this story because it's a little bit... Um, not naughty, but it's a little bit gross. But it's true. This is one of the retreats I was teaching over in Perth. And when I teach, and whenever I have the opportunity, I sit meditation as much as I can. You know why? Because I like it. It's fun, it's peaceful, you get joy coming up. So anyway, I was doing my meditation at one of these retreats in Jhana Grove. And of course, you know, I get some nice meditation, but I do need to go to the toilet from time to time. <laughs> you know what's coming up, don't you? <laughs> so uh, I went to the toilet to do what I call a number two. You know the difference between a number one and number two? Number one is urination, number two is the other. <laughs> so I did a number two. And don't criticize me for being gross because this has an important meaning behind it. <laughs> so I did a number two, you know, in one of the toilets there. And my mistake was to look in the bowl afterwards. And honestly, I know you're going to laugh, but this was a very profound truth. What I saw in that bowl was the most beautiful, brown piece of SHIT that I'd ever seen in my life. And don't just think, you know, I'm making this up. The different colors of brown. You know, have a look next time. It's not just one color. <laughs> and the way they interacted there. I don't know if you've ever done to art class, it's not just the colour, it's just the way they relate to one another. And this was like it was painted by a sort of an, a, a very powerful, very 
uh, amazing artist. And it's also, it's like a sculpture as well. It's actually shaped. <laughs> and the shape of it was, wow. You know, where did that come from? <laughs> and then lastly, the fragrance. <laughs> I don't know why you're laughing. You're predictable. You're laughing like that. Honestly, the fragrance. Sometimes as a monk, sometimes you go to dinners and stuff, you don't eat anything, but sometimes even with Queen Elizabeth, I remember going to that function once and with other really sort of uh, high-class people, and sometimes they wear all these fancy scents and fragrances, but that is kind of so fake. When it's just a fragrance of your own, piece of S-H-I-T. Now that was actually real. It was deep, nothing added. It was natural, not chemically in hearts, not sold in shops. And it was amazing, just the smell of it. Wow. And that can only happen when you've just come out of a deep meditation. <laughs> Even the contents of a toilet bowl after a number two looks to be one of the most beautiful and fragrant things you've ever seen in your life. And I'm not exaggerating. And I even did think, honestly, thought I should take that out and show <laughs> all the meditators. It was beautiful. How can you throw away something just so lovely? Uh, after that, or very close, yes. <laughs> Otherwise, it just looks ordinary thing. So anyway, so what I had to do was, I knew I couldn't take it out, so I had to press the button on the top. One of the hardest things I've ever done. <laughs> I knew I'd have to let it go. I didn't want to. It was beautiful and fragrant. Eventually, because of all the training I've had as a monk in my life, only that really helped me. If I hadn't been a monk for such a long time, I wouldn't have been able to do it. It'd probably still be there today. <laughs> I pressed the button, and that beautiful piece <laughs> of what was once part of my body just flew around and went down through the pipes into the septic tanks, gone from my life forever. I remember telling that story often, and as one of the meditators was one of the top scientists who worked at CERN in Switzerland, France, which was the, uh, the re not the reactor, the atom smasher, you know, which uh, throws protons and neutrons, fundamental particles at each other so fast, they can understand some of the early times of this universe. He was one of those scientists, and he said to me in an email, Thank you, Ajahn Brahm. You've now helped me understand what is beauty. And he was a bit of a philosopher as well. What is beauty? Beauty is, you can see that in anything, when your mind is so still and peaceful. Everything looks beautiful. And that is actually quite a profound truth. That is why monks like Ajahn Chah were always smiling and happy. That's why the Buddha was always joyful. Whatever you saw, you see it had a, a wonderful beauty to it, an acceptance. It wasn't in the thing itself. You can never say, and I don't say, no piece of SHIT is beautiful. The mind, which is so powerful, could see the beauty in it. Now imagine you were watching your breath, say. And the breath, you no, know, it's just the breath breathing in and breathing out. What's beautiful about that? But once you get into some nice deep states of meditation, the breath is gorgeous. It's not just beautiful, it's one of the most beautiful things you've ever seen. And limiters, the lights, wow! It's absolutely ecstatic. And that is an important part of meditation. 
the joy which you get. That joy keeps you healthy, keeps you energized, and gets so many other insights with it. But that's one of the insights which you're talking about right now. What is beauty? What is joy? What is happiness? And now you know what it is, and it's easy to get. And that would be my gift to you, or rather the Buddha's gift to you. Happiness, joy, beauty. You don't have to go to a shop to get it. It's just the way you see things. I know I went on a long time on that, but it's an important part of Dhamma. I'll just do one more question. Uh, can we finish a little bit earlier tonight? I'm not going to finish all the questions because I know Venerable Kai C is going to do the questioning tomorrow. <laughs> I've got some work for you. I'm sure I do a very good job. Last question. Good evening, Ajahn Brah. Please help advise how do we get old folks who have dementia, Alzheimer's, to do meditation? Thank you, Ajahn Brah. You know, it's, it's a bit too late if they've got dementia or Alzheimer's to do meditation. You know, if they really got stuck in that uh, and had uh, Alzheimer's dementia for a while. Obviously, you can't wait till the evening before the exam to do your homework. So get people to do meditation earlier. But nevertheless, it still can be done. And to be able to be done, it has to be something where you can actually interest and contact them somehow or other, even with some chanting. Because music is something which, you now people with dementia, they still can get um, interested into some of the favorite music they've heard before. I know many people, some Buddhists, have volunteered to go to the old people's home or dementia awards and played old-fashioned music which most people these days can't remember. And that, the elderly people dementia, they sort of come alive. You know, they're, you're actually contacting them with something they can recognize. But when it comes to doing some meditation, that is a little bit more difficult because to meditate, if you have learned before that now is the most important time, those with Alzheimer's can do that very easily. Now, they can't remember very much. They don't plan the future. I remember giving a talk upon the Buddhist idea of dementia. And I said that for another psychologist, a Buddhist psychologist, was giving me a definition of what dementia is. He said dementia is when you just don't remember the past, you don't worry about the future, and you become a little antisocial. And I said, that's me. <laughs> I let go of the past, <laughs> let go of the future. I like just being in solitude, in meditation. And I've been teaching that to others. I teach dementia, <laughs> but that's totally different. But and nevertheless, you have an understanding about the inner present moment, but actually to contact them, to be able to give them some advice is hard. And that's a difficulty. So if you can get the old folks to do that meditation beforehand, maybe a walking meditation might be possible. But I don't know about sitting meditation, it can be a bit too intellectual. With kids, I haven't done that here yet, but I do recall being asked to go and teach at a kindergarten in Singapore on Waysack Day. I thought it was just, you know, do a bit of chanting or something, not really teach. But when I got there, there was a number of kids, three years of old, four years of age, five, six ma maximum. I think I did tell this story already, but it was still, it really inspired me. You know, sometimes I inspire myself. You innovate, and sometimes when you innovate, it really works. So I said, well, Waysack, what happened on Waysack? The first, you know, the Buddha was born. 
So when he was born, he came out of his mother's womb and apparently walked seven steps, put his finger up and said, this is my last life and I'm the chief in the world. So, okay, kids, imagine you just come out of your mother's womb, you know, you're the Buddha, walk seven steps and put a finger up, and I had to tell him, not that finger, this finger. <laughs> and they did that, so, you know, they were playing about what it's like, you know, to be enlightened, or to be a Buddha born. Then, look at the picture, you know, just behind me here, the Buddha. He was meditating in Bodh Gaya, that's where he became enlightened. Now, you sit like the statue, you know, right leg over the left leg, right hand over the left hand, thumb slightly touching, back straight, chin in, close your eyes. Now imagine you just become enlightened. And that's when it really took off. I got all these kids imagining they were in this present moment, no past, no future, no worries, no concerns, nothing to do in their life, nothing to be afraid of, no, nothing, no task to do, nothing to clean up. Just this beautiful relax, and they really got into it. Sorry? So I can hear that. No, this is not the adults, this is the kids. <laughs> The kids were much wiser. <laughs> and I was just leading this, and the kids were responding to these suggestions. And they were just getting so peaceful. And so were the parents who were there as well. This wasn't a philosophy of their life. This was just in this moment. Imagine what it's like not doing anything. Nothing to do, ever. You're totally free. No, nothing to worry about. No bills you have to pay, nothing you have to save up for. No health problems at all. No, your body will relax to the max and you'll be totally healthy. No jobs you need to be do done. You don't have to get a house, you don't have to get a car. You don't need anything at all in your life. You're enlightened. I went on like that and I got into it as well. And I was in that evening, the I, I, I opened my eyes to finish it off, and the teacher said, no, no, carry on. Because the kids were really getting into it. We were actually connected with them, just using imagination. And so had the parents too, so they asked me to do that same meditation that evening for them. It works. Just imagine. Imagine right now, you're fully enlightened. Just imagine it. What would it feel like? Everything in your body relaxes. There's no tightness, attention, nothing you have to perform, no one you have to please. You're totally liberated, nothing to worry about. When you get into this, wow, you get what I call the taste of enlightenment. This is what it will feel like. Totally free, nothing to worry about forever. Anyway, the kids got into it. And that's one of the reasons why. I'm not sure if that would work with dementia patients or what, but it certainly works for young kids. Okay, I think I'm going to finish off now. And. Please, I apologize, I see there's so many questions in here. Please do your best. But not every question can get answered. I will tell one more story before you bow. <clears throat> there was one of these monks in Thailand I respected a lot. One reason was because when I first got to Thailand, he was in Sivirat Hospital, dying of cancer. His name was Ajahn Tate, Dhammarangsi. And he's written many books, he's an amazing monk, or he was before he died. But when he was being looked after by the king of Thailand at the time, Rama the Ninth, so he had the best doctors, nothing was too expensive, but eventually the doctors decided there was nothing more they could do for him. And he made the decision, if I'm going to die, I'd rather die 
in my monastery up in the northeast, which was on the Mekong River. And so he went up to his monastery to die. It took him about 27 years to die. <laughs> <laughs> he went into full remission. No treatment, just because he was back in his monastery relaxing. But he was such a well-known monk that I went to his monastery for a week or so and made an appointment to ask some questions from him. I was asking questions when I was a young monk. And I knew how difficult it was to see him. I had to wait myself for three or four days before you know, my name was up on the list and I could actually go into his room and ask him these important questions I had. So I really perfected these questions. I knew I wouldn't have much of a chance to finish these questions. I had to make them very clear and very brief. When I went into his room with these questions, been waiting for such a long time to ask, my mind went so still and peaceful. He was zapping me with his loving kindness and peace. Now he was one of these monks, and I put my hand up. He is a totally enlightened and arahant. Just a being in his presence, being sensitive enough to the peace and the kindness which he exuded in mammoth quantities, all my questions vanished. And I sat there and I felt stupid. You got a question, he asked. And I said, no. <laughs> and what I did say, you know, I think it's better that you answer your own questions. He said, yes, excellent. And that's where all my questions found their answers. The questions in here, they're important. I'll try and answer them to the best of my ability. But there'll come a time when all these questions over here, they don't need answers anymore. You're so peaceful, so kind. And those are the answers you don't need any more. That's beautiful. So I can't answer any more this evening. I've run out of time. But maybe you can ask them from Venerable Kaisi. Or if you don't want the questions answered at all, you can take them out. <laughs> The peace and the kindness is the only answer one really needs. Once one can actually feel that, you don't need any more questions. Isn't that wonderful? Okay, so now we can just do the sadhu sadhu sadhu.